Welcome back everyone, live here at Supercomputing 22 in Dallas, Texas. I'm John Furrier, host of theCUBE, here with Paul Gillen, editor of SiliconANGLE, getting all the stories, bringing it to you live. Supercomputer TV is theCUBE right now, and bringing all the action. And Kurt Bresnicker, chief architect of Hewlett Packard Labs, with HP Cube alumni, is here to talk about Supercomputing, Road to Quantum. Kurt, great to see you, thanks for coming on. Thanks for having me guys, great to be here. So Paul and I were talking and we've been covering you know, computing as we get into the large scale cloud now on premises. Compute has been one of those things that just never stops. No one ever, I never heard someone say I want to run my application or workload on slower, uh, slower hardware or processor or, or horsepower. Computing continues to go, but this we're at a step function. It feels like we're at a level where we're going to unleash new, new creativity, new use cases. You've been kind of working on this for many, many years at HP Hewlett Packard Labs. I remember the machine and all the, mm -hmm. the predecessor R&D. Where are we right now from your standpoint, HPE standpoint? Where are you in the computing? It's as a service, everything's changing. What's your view? So I think you, know, you capture so well, you think of uh, the capabilities uh, that you create. You create these systems and you engineer these amazing products and then you think, whew, doesn't get any better than that, and then you remind yourself as an engineer, but wait, uh, actually it has to, right? It has to because we need to continuously provide that next generation of scientists and engineer and artists and leader with the, with the tools that can do more, and do more, frankly, with less, because while we might want to run the program slower, we sure do want to run them for less energy, and figuring out how we accomplish all of those things, uh, I think is, is really where it's going to be fascinating. And, and it's also, you know, if we think about that, we think about that now exascale data center, billion, billion operations per second, the new science, arts, and engineering that we'll create, and yet it's also what's beyond. What's beyond that data center, how do we hook it up to those fantastic scientific instruments that are capable to generate so much information we need to understand how we couple all of those things together. So I agree, we are at, uh, at an amazing opportunity to raise the aspirations of the next generation. Yeah. At the same time, we have to think about what's coming next in terms of the technology. Is the silicon the only answer for us to continue to advance? You know, one of the big conversations is like refactoring, replatforming. We have a booth behind us that's doing energy. You can build it in data centers for compute. There's all kinds of new things. Is there anything in the paradigm of computing and on the road to quantum, mm -hmm. which I know you're involved, I saw you have an, on LinkedIn, you have an open rec for that. What paradigm elements are changing that weren't in play a few years ago that you're looking at right now as you look at the 20 mile stair into quantum? So I think for us, uh, it's fascinating because uh, we had a tailwind at our backs my whole career, 33 years at HP, and what I could count on was transistors got, at first they got cheaper, faster, and they use less energy. And then you know, that slowed down a little bit, now they're still cheaper and faster. As we look and that, and that Moore's Law continues to flatten out a bit, uh, there has to be something better to do than you know, yet another copy of the prior design. Opening up that diversity of approach, and whether it is the amazing wafer scale accelerators we see, these application specific silicon, and then broadening out even farther, Next to, the, next to the silicon, here's the analog computational accelerator. Here is now the, the emergence of a potential quantum accelerator. So seeing that diversity of approaches, but what we have to happen is we need to harness all of those efficiencies and yet we still have to realize that there are human beings that need to create the application. So how do we bridge? How do we accommodate the physics of a new kind of accelerator? How do we imagine the cyber physical connection to the, to the rest of the supercomputer? And then finally, how do we bridge that productivity gap? Especially not for people who like me, who've been around for a long time. We want to think about that next generation because they're the ones that need to solve the problems and write the code that will do it. You mentioned what exists beyond silicon. In fact, are you looking at different kinds of materials that computers in the future will be built upon? Oh, absolutely. You think of when, when we, we look at the quantum, the quantum modalities, and you know, whether it is a trapped ion or a superconducting uh, piece of silicon, or it is a uh, neutral ion, it, there's just no, there's about a half a dozen of these novel systems, because really what we're doing when we're using a, a quantum mechanical computer, we're creating a tiny universe, we're putting a little bit of material in there and we're manipulating it at the subatomic level, harnessing the power of, of, of quantum physics. 
that's an incredible challenge and it will take novel materials, novel uh, capabilities that we aren't just used to seeing, not many people have a helium supplier in their data center today, but some of them might tomorrow, and understanding, again, how do we incorporate, industrialize, and then scale all of these technologies. I want to talk Turkey about quantum, because we've been talking for, for five years, we've heard a lot of hyperbole about quantum, we've seen some of your competitors announcing quantum computers in the cloud. Uh, I don't know who's using these uh, uh, these computers, what kind of work they're being used. How much of the, how real is quantum today? How close are we to having workable, true quantum computers? And what, are, can you point to any examples of how it's being, how that technology is being used in the field? So uh, it, it remains nascent, uh, we'll put it that way. I think part of the challenge is we see this low level technology and of course it was you know, Professor Richard Feynman who first pointed us in this direction you know, more than 30 years ago uh, and you know, I, I, I trust his judgment yes. you know, that there's <laughs> probably some there there, especially for what he was doing, which is how do we understand and engineer systems at the quantum mechanical level? Well he said a quantum mechanical system is probably the way to go. So understanding that but still, Part of the challenge we see is that people have been working on the low level technology and they're reaching up to wondering, will I eventually have a problem that, that I can solve? And the challenge is, you can improve something every single day, and if you don't know where the bar is, then you don't ever know if you'll be good enough. I think part of the approach that we like to understand, can we start with the problem, the thing that we actually want to solve, and then figure out, what is the uh, bespoke combination of classical supercomputing, advanced AI accelerators, novel quantum, uh, quantum capabilities? Can we simulate and design that, and we think there's probably nothing better to do that than, than an exascale supercomputer. Yeah. Can we simulate and design that bespoke environment, create that digital twin of this environment, and if we, we've simulated it, we've designed it, we can analyze it, see, is it actually advantageous? Because if it's not, then we probably should go back to the drawing board, and then finally, that then becomes the way in which we actually run the quantum mechanical system in this hybrid environment. So it's nascent, you guys are feeling your way through, you got some moonshot, you work backwards from use cases as a, as a more of a discovery navigational mm -hmm. kind of mission uh, piece, I get that. And Exascale has been a great uh, role for you guys, congratulations. Has there been strides though in quantum this year? Can you point to what's been, the, is, has the needle moved a little bit, a lot, or I mean it's moving I guess there's, some, there's been some talk, but we haven't really been able to put our finger on what's moving. Like what need, where's the needle moved? I guess it, in quantum. And I think, I think that's part of uh, the conversation that we need to have is how do we measure ourselves? I know, um, at the World Economic Forum uh, Quantum Development Network, we had one of our Global Future Councils on the future of quantum computing, and I brought in uh, a senior, uh, IEEE fellow, Paolo Gargini, who you know, created the International Technology Roadmap for Semiconductors. And I said, Paolo, could you come in and, and give us examples? How was the semiconductor community so effective, not only at developing the technology, but predicting the development of technology? So that whether it's an individual deciding if they should uh, change careers, or it's a, a nation state deciding if they should spend a couple billion dollars, we have that tool to predict the rate of change and improvement. And so I think that's part of what we're hoping by participating, we'll bring some of that road mapping skill uh, and technology and understanding so we can make those better reasoned investments. Well, it's also fun to see supercomputing this year look at the bigger picture. I see software, cloud natives running modern applications, infrastructure as code, that's happening. You're starting to see the integration of, of environments, mm -hmm. almost like a global distributed operating system, that's the way I call it. Silicon and advancements have been a big part of what we see now. Um, merchant silicon, but also DPUs are on the scene, so the role of silicon is there. And also we have supply chain problems. Mm -hmm. So how, how do you look at that as a, uh, uh, chief architect of H. Hewlett Packard Labs, because not only you have to invent the future and dream it up, but you got to deal with the realities. And you get the realities are, silicon's great, we need more of that, quantum's around the corner, but supply chain, mm -hmm. how do you solve that? What's your thoughts and how, do you, how, is, how is HPE looking at silicon innovation and, and supply chain? Uh, and so for us, it, it is really understanding uh, that partnership model and understanding and contributing and 
So I will do things like I happen to be the, the systems and architectures chapter editor of the IEEE International Roadmap for Devices and Systems, that community that wants to come together and provide that guidance. You know, so I'm all about telling the semiconductor and the post-semiconductor community, okay, this is where we need to compute. I have a partner in the applications and benchmark that says, this is what we need to compute. And when you can predict in the future about where you need to compute, what you need to compute, you can have a much richer set of conversations because you described it so well, and I think our, our senior fellow, um, uh, Nick Dubay, would, he's coined the term, you know, internet of workflows, <laughs> where you, know, you need to harness everything from the edge device all the way through the exascale computer and beyond, and it's not just one sort of static thing, it is a very interesting fluid topology. I'll use this compute at the edge, I'll do this information in the cloud, I want to have this in my exascale data center, and I still need to provide the tools so that an individual who's making that decision can craft that workflow across all of those different resources. And those workflows, by the way, are complicated now. You got services being turned on and off, observability's a hot area, mm -hmm. you got a lot more data in, in cycle, in flow, I mean, a lot more action. And I think you just hit on another key point for us and part of our research at Labs, I have, uh, as part of my other assignments, I help draft our AI ethics global policies and pr principles, and not only tell, give us advice about, about how we should live our lives, uh, it also became the basis for our AI research lab at Hewlett Packard Labs, because they saw, here's a challenge, uh, and here's something where I can't actually believe I'll maintain my ethical compliance, I need to have engineer new ways of, of achieving artificial intelligence, and so much of that comes back to yeah. governance over that data, yeah. and how can we actually create those governance systems and, and do that out in the open. That's a can uh, of worms, we're going to do a whole segment on that, on one. Te <laughs> on that, one, on that one piece. I want to ask you, I mean, where rubber meets the road is where you're putting your dollars, so you've talked about a lot of a lot of areas of, of progress right now. Where are you putting your dollars right now at Hewlett Packard Labs? Yeah, so I think you know, when I draw when I draw my 2030 vision slide, uh, you know, I for me the first column is about heterogeneous, right? How do we bring all of these novel computational approaches to be able to demonstrate their effectiveness, their sustainability, and also the productivity that we can drive from from uh, from them? So that's my first column. My second column is that edge to exascale workflow that I need to be able to harness all of those computational and data resources. I need to be aware of the energy consequence of moving data, of doing computation, and find all of that while still maintaining and solving for security and privacy. But the last thing, and that's one was a, one was a how, one was a where, the last thing is a who, right? And is, is how do we take that subject matter expert? I think of a, a young engineer starting their career at HPE, it'll be very different than my 33 years, <laughs> and part of it was, you know, they will be undaunted by any, any scale. They will be cloud natives, maybe they'll be metaverse natives, they will demand to design an open cooperative environment. So for me, it's thinking about that individual and how do I take those capabilities, heterogeneous, edge to exascale workflows, and then make them productive. And, and for me, that's, that's where we were putting our emphasis on those three, when, where, and who. Yeah, and making it uh, compatible for the next generation. We see the student cluster competition going on over there. This is the only show that we cover, that we've been to, that is from the dorm room to the boardroom. And this, because supercomputing now is elevating up into that workflow, integration, multiple environments, cloud, premise, edge, metaverse. Yeah. This is like a whole nother world. And, and I, but I think it's, it's the way that, regardless of which human pursuit you're in, you know, everyone is going to be demand simulation and modeling, AI, ML, and massive data analytics. That's going to be at heart of, of everything, and that's what you see, that's what I love about coming here. This isn't just the way we're going to do science. This is the way we're going to do everything. We're going to come by your booth, check it out. We've talked to some of the folks, HPE, obviously HPE Discover this year, Green Lake with Center Stage. It's now consumption as a service for technology. Mm -hmm. Whole nother ball game. Congratulations on, uh, on all this, uh, the, I, I would say the massive, I won't say pivot, but you know, a, a change It is and, how and, you guys operate. And you know, it's funny, sometimes you think about the, the pivot to as a service is benefiting the customer, but as someone who has supported designs over decades, you know, that ability to, to 
uh, to operate and at peak efficiency to always keep uh, in perfect operating order and to continuously change while still meeting the customer expectations, that actually allows us to deliver innovation to our customers faster than when we are delivering warrantied individual packaged products. Kirk, thanks for coming on, Paul. Great conversation here. Yeah, the road to quantum is going to be paved through computing, supercomputing, software, integrated workflows from the dorm room to the boardrooms, the cube bringing all the action here at Supercomputing 22. I'm John Furrier with Paul Gillen. Thanks for watching. We'll be right back. Thank you.